Uh, I want to say good morning to everybody. I'm so excited this room is, is nearly full on a subject about taxation, but obviously what does that mean? That everybody's super passionate about this. And, and the title of this panel, U.S. Tax Reform, What's New and What Would It Mean, kind of belies how serious and intense I think this discussion is going to get because nothing gets people more frustrated and annoyed than talking about tax policy and tax policy reform because that's all that happens. People talk about it. And then nothing happens. So this time, we actually have a very esteemed panel who have a loud voice in the arena. I want to introduce them quickly because they're the ones who actually get up there on Capitol Hill. I mean, Phil Swagel just testified on Thursday. So mm -hmm. he was right. Did they listen? Ways and means. Uh, listened, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so. no, they heard. They, they might heard. not have really yeah, listened. Yeah, okay, so yes, as we do have Phil Swagel, he's the senior fellow at the Milken Institute. He's also a professor at the University of Maryland at the Public Policy School. To my left is Treasury Secretary Nancy Kopp, treasurer, of course, of the Secretary of the State of Maryland. But she said, please don't call me Madam Treasurer. <laughs> Just call me Nancy. So we're going to call her Nancy, and I'm not being rude about that. To my right is Mark Everson. You may all know him because he took your taxes back in the day. He was the IRS commissioner, but he is now also vice chairman of Alliant Group. And then Jared Bernstein, who is the economic policy fellow at the Milken Institute. He's also the former chief economist to Vice President Joe Biden. Thrilled to have all of you guys here. All right, so what I really wanted to start off with is the fact that, that the number one problem after the financial crisis really blew up was getting job creation back on board. And tax policy as it pertains to job creation is extraordinarily important to this nation right now and therefore to us. So I wanted to begin with this question. Everyone's talking about coming up with new tax policies. What tax policies are actually in place right now that incentivize corporate innovation, research and development instead of dissuade them? So what's in there already that we don't need to rewrite and why isn't it working right now? Jared Bernstein. <laughs> well, let me um, challenge your premise, if you don't mind. Why? Because I said it wasn't working? Uh, no, uh, I, I agree it's not working. Uh, <laughs> okay. For All two right. reasons. One is, and it was interesting the way you put it, um, one is the relationship between tax policy and job creation, mm -hmm. which I think is a lot more tenuous than your, than your question m might suggest. And secondly, you went from job creation to investment in R&D. <laughs> Right? And so it's possible to conceive of a tax um, structure that incentivizes uh, uh, investment in research and development that also doesn't lead to job creation. So there's like many links in the chain. Um, my first point, think about the Reagan years versus the Clinton years. Both of those cycles were associated with pretty robust job creation. One was, um, uh, in one case we had quite large supply-side tax cuts, of course, in the Reagan years. Uh, in another case, we had uh, the opposite. Uh, Cl Clinton um, uh, made taxes more progressive, raised more revenue through the tax code, ended up in surplus versus deficit in the Bush years. So I think it's actually not as easy as you'd think to look at the historical record and say this type of tax policy <laughs> leads to the, uh, uh, job creation. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll make one final point and, and, and then um, hear what others have to say on this. What I worry about mostly in the, in the space that you mentioned is tax policy that incentivizes overseas production, overseas operation, even overseas investment in R&D. Right now, we have a tax system that makes it considerably cheaper to invest in um, you know, Shanghai than in Indianapolis. And I think that's problematic, and I think it's in danger of getting worse. Uh, Mark, you worked yeah. in the Reagan administration, and, and I'm sure you have thoughts on this. Let me, uh, let me quibble a little, too, with the intro. Oh, you, attack you, the mediator. <laughs> that's it. I learned the moderator. From, it worked okay, for Newt Gingrich, right, you know? <laughs> uh, you used the word corporate. That's the wrong word. We, we need to talk about Small business. business yeah. No, business. Mm -hmm. uh, it was interesting. Yesterday I was over at the panel, the financial regulation panel, and there was a clear consensus that everything has been set up to talk about the banks rather than, meaning regulating entities rather than regulating activities. And that's the way we should be dealing with the tax code. We should be looking at economic activities. I agree exactly with what Jared just said. Uh, what we do at Align is we work with small and mid-sized businesses. Mm -hmm. Remember, 
two-thirds of the American private sector workforce works for businesses with fewer than 1,000 employees. They may be supplying the big guys, but they are not big, and they are oftentimes not corporations. They're the flow-throughs, and there are important incentives. We support R&D. That is real, but there are things that are limiting right now. If you look at the big guys, Merck or GE, they're taking everything they're entitled to. The smaller folks, they aren't aware of uh, some of the incentives, mm -hmm. which can be helpful. And on the other hand, frankly, they're limited because of the AMT, which knocks out the yeah. use of some certain benefits Can on I the ask business one side. Quick question, Omar. Mm -hmm. Are, is part of what you're saying that the multinationals have a tax advantages over the SMEs, the small, medium? Should size? we take that away, or, or at least to? I mean, is that it? part of what you're saying? And yeah, should it? Well, what I what I'm saying, Jared, is that if you talk about simplification, it's not just about eliminating different expenditures. It's about consistent treatment of all activities, regardless of form or size. And, yeah. or size. That's exactly right. Now, I'm not troubled, frankly, by incentivizing smaller businesses or startups. Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk about job creation. The dinner last night, the presentation, the guys talking about sitting there and in their office, living in their office when they were starting up their business. They're, they weren't getting a tax benefit for that because they weren't paying taxes. There's a bill before Congress right now that would actually give some some help against your payroll taxes, if you will, for R&D for startups. I think that's a good idea. Okay, we'll get to payroll taxes in a minute, but right. Nancy, you wanted to jump in. Well, I, I, the first thing, I, forgive me, but I agree with the two gentlemen <laughs> about, uh, about the question. I'm but, bleeding on the but, inside uh, right, right now. I'm going to come to your He'll defend. Your He'll defend. He'll He'll defend. defend. He'll defend. Anyway, I'm dying here, people. But you know, one of the problems, I think, Jared, I was going to ask you, was, was isn't it a question of time frame and that also deals with the small versus the large versus perhaps uh, uh, the, the, the global and, and what the impact is of a particular tax change at one particular time or, or an incentive at one particular time. Um, I, I would say in Maryland, for instance, not tax incentives, but we have incubators that actually have led to growing, growing companies right. and, and employment. That's not tax, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of a substitute. But it was at the right time in, in the life cycle of, of the companies, too. I think what I'm trying to say, Nancy, is, is in sync with where you're going. And um, I'd be interested, Liz, if, if you would agree with yeah. this statement, um, because you, you hear this all the time on, in the media, I suspect, is, is that what I hear in my world, Phil, I think you probably hear this in your world, too, is a constant you know, a, assertion that this tweak in the tax code at the margins for some favored group will you know lead to an explosion in job growth and you know that that's a never true b almost always bad policy and c typically just leads to inefficiency and okay. waste okay what i do hear <laughs> is why bother with uh, carried interest, it's just a rounding error. You know what? Ten rounding errors together equals a trillion dollars suddenly. So I don't like to hear the whole rounding error mm -hmm. discussion. But Phil Swagel, what about you? Okay, so I, I, I agree actually with, with, with Jared said at the very end. And I, first of all, I accept the premise of the question, so suck up to the moderator. Thank that's, you. That's <laughs> you know, I wrote myself a note, be nice to Liz. No, I'm so, going to cross um, myself so, even though I'm Jewish. Yeah, yeah, there's, so there's a, there's a sense in which Right, we had we had lots of tax policy at the short term, the cash for clunkers and the housing tax and all that stuff. And uh, you know, we can debate whether whether that was effective or not, but it's 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 run its course. It's time to have a longer horizon. And I feel like that's where that's is where, where tax policy has to shift has to shift to the longer horizon. And look, there's big debates. I think there's agreement on you know growth, um, uh, simplicity and fairness and you know what but of course fairness is in the eyes of the beholder so there's not like you know jared and i will agree on tax policy but i think we, at least we agree on the objectives mm -hmm. and it's time to to move toward that objectives and uh, so I, I, as liz said i testified last thursday at ways and means on housing policy and it was is a little depressing well well let's just yeah. be, you well, get well, to let's be clear here the mortgage deduction and, and things like that right yeah Where exactly it's all about the it, MIT. Cut it, right. yeah it's depressing because exactly what jared said is that you know it's very narrow if you take away any little bit of the 1.1 million dollar tax break on mortgages then you there know, goes the there whole goes housing. which of course is like oh come on there's a big picture if we can have a big big scale pro growth tax reform you know, then, then the guys with second homes in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, they'll be fine, right? I mean, they'll be, you know, even if they lose a little bit of their tax break. Okay, can, can I just make right, Can I just jump in on tax reform? Yes, and then we'll... Yeah, and job creation mm -hmm. um, from a completely different perspective, but I'm a one-note Jane. 
on, on this, the municipal uh, uh, tax yes. exemption. Right. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Let me tell you, for 100 years since the creation of the income tax, municipal bonds have been tax exempt, general obligation bonds particularly. Those bonds, just in the last 10 years, about $1.65 trillion, and, and that's a ballpark, I know. Um, create jobs because they create schools, they create roads, they create the infrastructure of this nation. 75% of the infrastructure of this nation is created through municipal bonds and it is the public-private partnership that has worked for the last century. I'll tell you that, that if, if you do away with the tax exemption, either you have fewer schools, roads, college buildings, or they are paid for another way. The other way will be the state taxes. State taxes, in fact, are more regressive than the federal uh, income tax. There'll be property tax and sales tax, burden on the middle class to pay for the middle class schools under the theory that somehow we're getting at the wealthy. Okay, sold. We get it, right? Okay, we don't want to see that tax benefit from munis go away, but that just underscored, what Nancy just said underscored, how there are people from all realms very fighting for their piece, their side, whether it's the shrimpers down in Louisiana or the vineyard guys <laughs> in, in, you know, Nantucket. Who, I'm telling you, you can get anybody up here and they will fight this battle. All we've been talking about is what incentives and what breaks we shouldn't get rid of when it really comes to taxes. I, I there are three issues. Hold on. <laughs> what should get taxed? We got a sixteen trillion dollar de deficit here that we have to look at. <laughs> what should get taxed? Who should get taxed? And then a nod to you, Mark, the enforcement side. Let's flip the conversation for the moment to who should get taxed. Okay, can I? Uh, if I might, can, can you put up slide four, please? If if somebody. Okay, nobody's eyes glaze over. It, he has no, this, a slide. This is, this is not. But he promised it was good. This is a fun slide, I think. If we ah, good. Okay, so. Isn't that fun? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Would you describe um, that as <laughs> jolly, jolly? Jo yeah, because this <laughs> hilarious. This is this is one of. This is one way to answer your question, in my humble opinion. There's a better way, by the way, which we can get to, which is to cap deductions at a particular rate. But this gets to, this, this says, look, we, every year we um, forego $1.1 trillion in revenue and tax expenditures. And everybody says, let's get rid of tax expenditures. John Boehner says, let's get rid of tax expenditures. Phil Swagel and I both agree. Nancy probably agrees with a bunch, but, you know, wants to carve out one. <laughs> and so we need a set of criteria by which to decide which tax expenditures are worthy and which uh, are the ones we should shut down, unless we just want to cap them all, which might be easier and politically. So I came up with this typology, which says, here's what you should consider. The revenue foregone, the efficiency, the fairness, and then like politically how hard a lift it is. And this is just one typology, and all of those letters in there, which stand for low, medium, high, very low, et cetera, mm -hmm. all of those letters in there are completely subjective, which may kill the whole thing. But mm -hmm. um, but that is, that is, so if you look at the mortgage interest deduction, it's big in terms of revenue foregone, 100 billion a year. Um, the efficiency is very low, and you know, Phil, I'm sure that was the core of your testimony. Um, it's not very fair, it's upside down, reasons we can discuss. And so I say, bye bye, get rid of it. But then you get to political lift, which is incredibly heavy, so I'm not sure where you go with that. But uh, it, it, I, I thought this might be a way to, to talk about the, the, your question. Well, that's, that, that becomes, yeah. th that issue is, is uh, listen, mm -hmm. if everybody suffers and nobody's happy, then maybe it is a good opportunity and maybe it does work, Phil. I mean, at some mm -hmm. point, we've got that huge black cloud of 16 trillion. We're not bringing in enough. And, and after we talk about this, I want to get to the enforcement side as well. Mm -hmm. But sure, I mean, to me, so, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll disagree with some of these, but I think this is the right way to do it. I mean, to, to me, the key, battleground might be too strong, but the key discussion is going to be over the tax treatment of saving, right? I mean, essentially, what, what happens to, to dividends and capital gains, and then on, on one side, and then the, t the tax-preferred investment vehicles on the other side, the 401ks and, and the like. And in some sense, the administration, I think, has set up this debate with their proposal for a global cap, right? You save too much, we're going to tax you, we're going to penalize you for it. Which, in some sense, I think is exactly the wrong, the wrong direction <laughs> for tax policy. But look, that's the, that's the debate uh, that, that I think we're going to see going forward. Uh, let me get in here. I, I think that it's questionable whether we're heading towards tax reform mm -hmm. in the sense that if all you do is cap deductions, mm -hmm. um, 
you're certainly not simplifying the code. In, in fact, you're making the code more complicated. If you look at what happened in the fiscal cliff at the end of the year, they put back in certain limitations. That made the code much more complicated, not simplified it. So uh, I don't favor that. I think if we're going to have this, Congress should do its job and make some of the choices that my colleagues on the panel well, are, are talking about. Well, does not mean they have about. to tune out the lobbyists. They're going to have to do that. Very and hard. It, it's not going to let, let me, Well, let me just say this. It's up to the president. Now, it's very intriguing. Yesterday, we had two very powerful individuals at the table with the chairman of this institute. Taxes was not discussed. <laughs> was, there any, was there any oomph on this subject? No. The president doesn't give it any oomph. He talks about, I'm going to do everything I can on guns and everything I can on immigration. I'm, I'm for that. <laughs> but this will not, despite all the efforts of Baucus and Camp, who I, I respect both those individuals. They're very sound, uh, solid legislators, and they're trying to get something done. But this, because of what you've just seen in the last 15 minutes, will go nowhere if we don't have but the president it's, it's in there. it's not just the president. I, 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 isn't, is it not, in your humble opinion, also uh, a matter of a group of, they tend to be conservative Republicans, who say absolutely no on revenues? Well, but, but you've we got Grover Norquist, which, which, Grover right. Norquist, exactly. which, by the way, right. he's been quite silent recently, if any of you have noticed, on the Internet sales uh, tax like, issue. I thought he said that was a tax increase, no good. Well, barely, but he doesn't get no. the, the Pied Piper following that he has for other things. It's and let me just throw it out there. I'm wondering because Internet sales tax tends to affect middle and lower class mm -hmm. people. So is it only when the wealthy are affected here that Grover Norquist starts to scream and yell because it's an easier fight when you have the big voices like the, the Koch brothers you know, involved? I'm just, I'm just saying, and yes, I am a Fox anchor. A Fox <laughs> business anchor, don't be shocked, I also went to Berkeley. <laughs> so I, 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 maybe I'll jump in just for a moment. I, I thought one of the worst moments of the camp, presidential campaign was the 10 to 1, right? Yeah, you know, that was yes. just awful. Yeah. And so, you know, so I'm not... Well, just um, for people who oh, might yeah. not just, be okay, so, so when where all the candidates, like the 100 Republicans running for president, would you, you know, if there's a deal that was $10 of spending cuts for $1 of revenue, they all said no, which uh, it's hard to imagine that Governor Romney actually believed what he was saying, but whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, I think we have to be pragmatic. I mean, I think there is leadership needed from the administration. I think we all have a good sense of what tax policy the president doesn't like and what Social Security changes and Medicare changes he doesn't like. It's pretty tough to understand where he wants to end up, right? What's the level of spending to, re spending to GDP or revenue to GDP that's his target? I have no idea. And I think until we know that, it's hard to... You know, to really Nancy, go forward. do you uh, do you have a window into that as somebody who is constantly having these constantly discussions? Constantly talking with the president? No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, I really don't. You don't have that bullhorn. But, but but I do think that what is missing is is just to build on what what Phil said. I think we really have to talk in plain language. I believe in democracy. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I was an elected member of the legislature for more than a quarter century, which I'm sure people think is too long, but I enjoyed it. Um, it, it people will understand uh, the antiseptic term, for instance, of uh, entitlement. I think we should talk about Social Security and health care and what the cuts mean to real people. Talk about tax efficiency fairness. I think, I think people can understand it. They can deal with it. And I think the politicians can deal with the lobbyists if they feel that their constituents can understand what's going on. But as long as it's just a bunch of people in, in Washington, so so-called Washington Republicans, Washington Democrats, uh, talking in generalities, I don't think anything For everybody who sits here and runs their own household, we know that you try never to spend more than what actually comes in. Okay, so again, well, that's not what Well, unless you have a house unless you have a student uh, loan, no, that's not so. I, well, I don't think that's but so. But this is America. This is a country where we really aren't even close to wrapping our arms around this, and we need some more money coming in. I do want to get to the issue of enforcement, mm -hmm. because, Mark, you, you actually had this formula, service plus enforcement equals compliance. Well, we still have about $300 billion out there that goes uncollected. Let's not call that a rounding error. What do we need to do to at least start scooping that back into the revenue pile? Right. Um, 
the concern here would be it, nobody likes to give money to the IRS, but the overall funding levels for the service are, are important. It, I actually support the sequestration in the sense that we had to do something. I mean, I've been in big companies and this blunt instrument, uh, ultimately even industry leaders, they say we've got to make the budget, everybody cuts by 5%. It's, it gets down to that, unfortunately. Uh, in the case of the IRS, and I'm not arguing they should have been exempted, but when you cut 600 million, you have fewer audits, you have lower collection activities, and then on the service side, it's harder to get through on the phones, people can't get their questions answered. So You're underfunded. I mean, they're the IRS underfunded. Is underfunded. And, and the other thing is, look what's coming down the road. That, well, there are two things that really impact that. How many people in this room have been impacted by identity theft or know somebody who has? That's a pretty shockingly high number. Mm -hmm. And it has a devastating impact on the tax system. And it'll get to a point, if we're not careful, where there will be a real alteration in, the, in this traditional send in your return and you get your refund 10 days or two weeks later. So there, there's a real issue there. Plus the other thing, Jared, your, your team uh, from the White House, the health care. The health care bill has huge ramifications upon the service. A lot of information goes through the IRS. It's going to be a very difficult uh, task for them. So you can't ignore that agency and, and expect to make progress on what you just talked about, that tax gap, or keep people, uh, let's say, nobody's happy with the IRS, but you want people to be respectful and feel that it's fair and that they can get answers. We, w we had a, a very difficult period in the 90s where the service was in bad odor and there was a lot of, of animus towards the service, but in many ways it didn't matter, you could argue, because we had the surpluses. Mm -hmm. We need the money now, so you're right. We need the money, yeah. So I, I, I wanted to make two points, if I might, sure. about that. Um, actually, somebody, somebody stole my identity, but after a day they called me and begged me to take it back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Shecky. Yeah. I'm here all week, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, when, when Mark says that the IRS is, uh, is, is underfunded, um, I, I want people to understand that that doesn't mean underfunded like um, an agency that can't provide it's food stamps or something. What 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 we're saying, which is also a, a critical. What it means is that a dollar more to the IRS would yield well more than yeah. a dollar yeah. right. in revenue. So and, and revenue that's owed. It's this is not a new tax. Like as, right. as Liz is saying, this is a, a gap. Mm -hmm. Secondly, on the Market Fairness Act taxing the retailers, uh, you, you made an interesting point about uh, the internet uh, internet retailers. You made an interesting point about Norquest, um, a connection I hadn't quite made, because the other thing that he didn't raise his eyebrows about was when the payroll tax holiday expired, which, by the way, meant well over $100 billion more in taxes uh, in 2013, but it's uh, a paycheck thing. And, and there may be a connection there that, you know, he just doesn't get, he's a lobbyist. I mean, he is a registered lobbyist, and he just doesn't get as riled up unless it affects the high-income folks. Look, the retail thing we're, we're talking about, just to be clear, what we're talking about is this idea that, that when you buy something over the Internet, you're supposed to pay sales tax on it in your state. Even if the person you're, uh, in, 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 even the place you're buying it from is, is out of state. That's not a new tax. That's a tax enforcement issue. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to pay that tax yourself, but nobody does. And, you know. But can we put the genie back in the bottle on the internet tax, Philip? I, I think it'll be hard. I'm actually surprised it's gone as far as it has. Um, and Didn't it get 70 votes in the Senate? Yeah, same? it got an, ama an amazing number of votes. Right. I, you know, it, it's tougher in the House. Um, I, one thing that's fascinating to me is that this thing is just, <coughs> in sense, has been on a, a hotline, um, an expressway. There hasn't been the kind of debate over it, and I think that does reflect the revenue. The well, revenue. Okay, climate. so let me go. I find that amazing. As somebody yeah. who who was uh, working on this issue in the state legislature at least 15 years ago, yeah. I mean, this is not a new issue. The mm -hmm. uh, the internet tax, and at one time we were told it was impossible because you couldn't calculate all those things. Well, clearly, um, it's you can calculate anything now. And the question is where the bricks and mortar uh, uh, businesses have been. And my sense is they're now getting yeah. together realizing yeah. that their clocks are being cleaned. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think it's not by, just them. It's the, it's the states, Nancy, because this the revenue a, a big, yes, a big oh, you point bet. here is um, yeah. while the country's overall finances are getting healthier, that's not true in, in, a, in an important number of states. And they're starting to look in, in these various crevices 
to, to right. figure out where they can get revenues. We're going to keep moving along because we could talk all day mm -hmm. about Internet taxes. But there are, are little portions where, again, I get crazy about this issue. Where, oh, well, why are we looking at that? It's a rounding error. It's a rounding error. But in the yeah. aggregate, it really does make a big difference. And that is, and I know we have some private equity people in here, and we're thrilled that you're here, but the carried interest <laughs> issue. Yeah. Okay. So, so the economy isn't exactly going gangbusters here, and yet we did see the expiration of the payroll tax cut. So, you know, you look at that and you say, how do we just the, the private equity people getting the carried interest break, meaning they're taxed at a much lower rate than everybody else, when the people who get the huge benefit talk so much about reducing the deficit. So I can, I, I'll start. I, so politically, I'm surprised it's lasted so long. Um, uh, you know, it's probably good for Senator Schumer's uh, you know, sort of fundraising. But, um, I, I, you know, it seems like it carried, if someone asked me, carried interest and the, the mortgage deduction on a second home, those are, you know, the, the, the next things to be, to be gone. Um, I, you know, on the other hand, if you look at it carefully. First of all, do you think that's true, though? The next things to be gone? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Those, those, I mean, eventually those two things won't. You can read it on the chart. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank yeah, you, Jared. So that's, that's where I agree with Jared. Those, those two <laughs> things, it's hard to. Charts. So, uh, Alan, you. Yeah. <laughs> I think Alan Viard at AEI has done a series of very careful yeah. analyses of the carried interest. And he, he shows that it's really a reallocation of a tax burden. And it really is, it's the result of having so many tax-exempt en entities that have um, large investment positions, right? So it's all the you know, universities, endowments, uh, things like that, that the carried interest effectively just reallocates tax benefits, right? It's someone who's tax-exempt can't have a, a, a tax benefit because they already have it. And so the carried interest in some is a way of reallocating that. I, I think that's too complex, right? I couldn't explain it if you gave me 30 minutes. And I, I think that's why it's, it's going to be gone. Whereas the, the mortgage interest deduction, ironically, it's so easy to explain. I think that's why the second homes are going to be gone. So it's like the, the two things on the ends, it's hard, you know, something really complex or something really simple are, are both going to be Jared? at risk. Well, you know, interestingly, on my, I did include carried interest on my little evaluator here. And, um, you know, it doesn't, it, there's not a lot of revenue for gone. Um, so, but doesn't, uh, the, isn't there psychological revenue? Yeah, absolutely. Where no, the it, rest of us who are paying 30 to 50%. Exactly. Thank it's, it's, you. You're right. And, and so, you know, the fact, and, and, you know, we shouldn't call $5 billion a year a rounding error either. I mean, I agree with you. Uh, it's very low on efficiency. It's very low on fairness. And I put that it's, it's a low political lift. And there I may have been like way, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I take Phil's point, but Phil's saying, you know, someday it will be gone. And I, yeah, so I, just, can I just, I, I just I really briefly, so I, here's the part where I disagree is on the efficiency, right? So, you know, my, my vision of long-term tax reform would be to lower the tax rate on saving and investment. And this is part of it, right? A tax and carried interest is a tax on saving and a tax on investment. Now, the form is unpalatable politically. I, I absolutely get that. But it still is a tax on saving and investment. So let's argue uh, so about that for a second. Yeah. Let, let's because because we disagree in, in 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 you know in a substantive way that may not have quite come up yet. And by I mean, the way, we will be opening this up to questions in the last fifteen minutes. Yeah. So I want you guys just so to know I that you'll have an opportunity. What I mean by inefficiency is is something very simple and very explicit in the tax debate, which is you shouldn't subsidize something that is going to is going to happen anyway. That's just a waste. And uh, it, it, worse, than, worse than wasting money in revenue, you're actually um, uh, incentivizing people to uh, do more of something than they would otherwise. That's just bad for an economy. So if you cap, um, and, and Phil, Phil criticized this earlier, and it, here we disagree. If you cap, for example, um, if you cap uh, your contributions to a retirement fund at a level that is you know, very high, then I, I think you're actually closing an inefficiency because uh, absent the cap, you're going to have people who are going to save anyway and they're getting a tax benefit for something they would have done anyway. Same thing with carried interest. I can't see where that engenders any kind of saving or investment behavior that wouldn't happen absent the tax break. Okay. Yeah. So just, I'm, you know, again, Jared said correctly that we, we disagree on the substance, and it's a longer, longer debate. I, I think there are that the tax system does matter, and sometimes that's where I would want to move away from. It's not possible to do it fully, but you want to have a tax system that interferes with people's choices as little as possible. And the dimension of saving versus spending is a dimension where I would want the tax system not to interfere, right? And we we very heavily uh, tax, we double, or in some cases triple tax, saving uh, and therefore investment. And I would want to to uh, reduce that, which is what the Bush administration tax policy uh, agenda was at. And, and I think, do think it matters. I don't think it's 
it's correct to say someone with five million in saving, the tax system doesn't matter, they'd save that anyway. Right, right. right? It's just that well, the tax system matters. I'm glad, Jared, that you did bring this up about the president making a lot of noise about capping IRA contributions, 401ks. A show from the audience, who thinks that's a good idea? I mean, you, people are getting older and they're living longer and it's getting more expensive to be older. Well, let me just, Why, I, Jared, you're, you're on the administration side. Who thinks this is a good let idea? Let me add a number to this. Do you, so do you know the number he's capping it at? 3.4 million. Yeah. Okay. There are 0.3% IRAs, not 3%, not 0.3%, mm -hmm. 0.3% IRAs with accumulations above that amount. This is a very rarefied atmosphere up here. Um, folks, Mark, is, do you agree with that, Mark? I mean, from the I'm not in that atmosphere. <laughs> <laughs> Inspired to be so. Yeah. So yeah. Yes. yes, the believe me, those those people are gonna the folk, folks in the in the top 0.3 percent of IRA yeah, accumulations are gonna save anyway. So right. I'm not worried. I'm not worried about the decision. Look, I guess the argument I'd ask you and Phil and others is: Would you com if you completely uncap? IRAs, you are absolutely creating a tax shelter. I, I don't see how you can't, I guess I don't see how you see that otherwise, and I guess Sorry. I'm in opposition to the whole well, audience Well, if we're going to cut back on Social Security and people are going to depend less, I mean, I'm not saying we are going to cut back on Social Security, but if, if we're going to attack entitlements and, and really get realistic about cutting the deficit here, mm -hmm. then don't, don't you need to sort of give people that opportunity, Nancy, to, to do it on their own? The, oppor the opportunity, yes, talking about capping, uh, uh, capping uh, Social Security, by the way, compared to 3.5 million, what's the average Social Security benefit? The uh, average benefit is 14,000 a year. 14,000 mm -hmm. a year, that's right. That's what we're really talking about. That's what we're talking, talking about cutting. That's the sort of thing that I said, I think you've got to give the facts to the people, mm -hmm. put, put real human faces on things and bring it down from that ultra atmosphere to, what, to, what's, to what's real. Uh, the average uh, state employee in Maryland, what do you think he makes? About 47000 a year. They're not saving huge amounts because they don't want to. <laughs> They're saving huge amounts because they don't have to, the, uh, because they can't. Mm -hmm. The growing disparity in wealth in this nation, not, not income, but, but, but wealth, is going to create political problems, I think. I think that what we are talking about is, is, is the nub of a very large social political question I, I and not, not simply I could fiscal. not agree with you more. In fact, Jeff Green, who is a, uh, uh, one of the people here who's on a panel, he's a self-made billionaire. Okay? He made his, his billions in, in real estate. And he very much believes that if you look at that disparity between the wealthy and the poor, as it continues to grow, you guys, you know, people who are, who are looking at, at which leader you really want to see, and, and people are against President Obama in some cases, for Mitt Romney, vice versa, that you are actually going to eventually not be worrying about somebody like a, a President Obama, but more of a, as he put it, an Hugo Chavez, because the, the voices are going to get louder as it becomes less fair and, and almost bearable out there. So, so we need to do something. What is the chance that we are actually, Philip? going to get Congress to move on any of this where, where we get the revenues coming in and the, the situation becomes fairer. Yeah, I, it's tough, and, and I agree. I actually agree it's an urgent problem. I, I, inequality, it's actually surprising to me that as a nation we're willing to put up with as much as we do. Um, I, I think tax policy is, is part of it. Spending policy has to be part of it as well, including entitlement course, reform. Of course, yes. Strengthen the bottom and, and you know impose the burden of adjustment at, in the middle and the top. Um, but to answer the question directly, it's pretty depressing looking out. Are we going to see entitlement reform in the rest of President Obama's, well, I'm sorry, entitlement and tax reform, put those together in the second term, it's hard to, it's hard to see it. I, I, let me just say this. Mm -hmm. it, it was very interesting because if you go back, go back to what you were talking about, really the essence of this progressivity and mm -hmm. do you want more revenues coming in, if you go back to the endless series of debates that were on the Republican side, it was a race to simplification and flat tax and, and, and really a, an assault on progressivity was the conversation that was taking place. I'm, I'm an advocate of, uh, of reform. I believe the first thing you need to do in reform is you need to have greater permanency for the code. We haven't talked about that, but that's a fundamental driver 
of confidence in terms of the business and investment. And I, simplification? I, that's, a, that's my third point. The mm -hmm. second point I always talk about is progressivity. I think progressivity has served our nation well. That's been a contract that's been a part of the income tax for 100 years. It's changed. The income tax, it started out really as a strip affecting just a very small number of people, and then it was broadened in, in the Second World War is when it really became a broader tax, and you've got the, the, the employment taxes that came in as well, of course. But uh, that, that is, I think, was settled in the election not in the degree, but, but the idea that we were going to really level this out. Uh, y you know, yet Steve Forbes made those arguments in 96, but uh, that was a different era, as Phil's talking about or Nancy's talking about. We've, we, the income disparity has changed. It's, it's widened. It's still widening. So I think that debate is over. We're just talking about a question of degree now. And I would tell, tell you, Liz, that um, things like the carried interest or maybe the caps, some of these things we're talking about, I think you could get more revenues agreed to on certain measures mm -hmm. because of the symbolism that you mentioned that is associated yeah, with Yeah, the, the psychological so, issues. Yes. So yeah. a little bit of, of, of real politics. It's funny. I, I come to this conference every year, and I have really reasonable conversations with people uh, with lots of good ideas like the ones you just heard. And then I go back to Washington, and it's like a completely different world. Why is that? Um, well, I think uh, it has to do with the people who are talking here and the people who are talking there. Different group of people with very different sets of incentives and constituents. Um, the, the, you know, I, I, heard, I heard Senator Corker on the stage yesterday saying, I, in so many words, don't, you know, this is not me quoting him, so you, you should go back and see exactly what he said. I don't want to get him, get him wrong. But being, you know, quite open to revenues, I thought. Um, uh, uh, I recall John Boehner offering the president $800 billion in revenues over 10 years, as not that long ago. So, you know, you may be right that there is some space uh, for the kind of reforms mm -hmm. that Liz, Liz and others are calling for, um, but it's hard for me to see uh, um, that happening. Mm -hmm. uh, with with this group, basically, I don't mean this group. Uh, I mean with the the the, <laughs> yeah. the Congress that we're dealing with. Okay. Um, before we take questions, I want to ask you all. Uh, can I just say on quickly, one quickly? I really, really like this point about permanency. Um, I think we could have a real knockdown mm -hmm. drag out about what it is we'd want to lock in. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that is just awful <laughs> about our tax policy is this idea that's driven by lobbyists that. You can change. You can make all these changes right, right, to like right. get your client. Make it like the Constitution, uh, damn it. You know, it, right? it, I I have a strong my sense of history. This is not just gut. This is like analysis of history and tax policy. That if you locked in a tax policy that like reasonable people would agree on, it would probably be somewhat progressive, but it would protect savings and you know there'd be things in there for Phil. And you lock that in. <laughs> um, University professors. Exactly. Yes, that's true. They get a car back. So, so on that point about yeah. lobbyists, uh, tax reform. So, sorry, I've got to make a specific pitch on that. I would say have a 10-year sunset on tax provisions so you marry up to the budget window and the way the analysis is done. I don't, I don't like anything that's really shorter right. than that. Okay. That's all. Okay. Sorry. Um, anytime you talk about tax reform on a comprehensive basis, yes, the lobbyists come yeah. out of their... Very expensive homes in Virginia. May I may I add that the housing prices <laughs> jump exponentially there. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I know you did. I, that for you, that was there. So, so my final question to all of the panel before we take the questions from the audience is: If you could have one area of tax reform that you could get through, you could change one thing. What would it be, Philip? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, I, you know, I, I think I would start with the global cap on deductions, not because I think it's the best long-run policy, but it's the best imme uh, intermediate step, right? I think we need to address some of the deductions that, that Jared has up there. I think a global cap is a way of starting the, the, starting the conversation and, and getting something done. Again, I, I'd rather dig in on the, on the specifics. I think that might be politically too difficult, so the global cap would be a first step. So, Nancy? I really, uh, I, I, I'm not sure. What I would like to see, rather than my preference, is to actually have things laid out in public in English and allow people to look at them and understand what the impact is. I, I don't think we have seen that, and I think that's the key 
to helping the people okay. of this nation but understand. Can I just push you on an answer? Because I want everybody yeah. to come up with an It's not necessarily what you want to see. It's what you believe would maybe bring in the most revenues and work the best. See how hard it is? It, well, I mean, well it is very hard. Right, That's yeah. why I'd like to see them all laid out and see, see uh, according to a grid like that, what the differences are. I'm going to give Nancy exactly. some time. I always let somebody else order first. At, <laughs> yeah. 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 I'll take you off the hook for a minute. Thank and you take much. a bite of her. Really, yeah. really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's this permanency. Look, Congress didn't even, ex they did a good job of making permanent a lot of the Bush era That's, cuts at the mm -hmm. end. But they rolled over yet again a lot of the business incentives, like the R&D, the things we think are important that we were talking about earlier. Right. Let's deal with this with some of those issues and give some certainty so that business people around the country have some visibility, and then you can have uh, sensible debates on other things as you go forward. Anybody, anybody care about the repatriation of, of offshore profits? Oh, that's a terrible idea. That's a bad idea. Yeah, yeah okay. I wouldn't do that. Okay. But do you want me to tell you what I would do? You want me to answer your question and give me some more questions? Yes, thank you. Question. I, or, or, or do you want me to ex explain says, why I yeah. think repatriation no, is bad? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, Phil took mine. Uh, I like the 28. I like capping deductions. Um, it, the, the president's proposal uh, raises $600 billion uh, over 10 years, caps deductions at 28% for upper income folks, and completely obviates this really ugly food fight about every single one of them. Because if you're capping them, you don't have to fight about every one. So I thought that is a neat idea. But since Phil already said it, yeah. I have um, <laughs> I have two others. Too. I, ha I have two. I have two others. Uh, first, I would I would I would get rid of deferral, tax deferral for um, uh, foreign uh, earnings. The idea that um, a multinational can defer its earnings from U.S. taxation as long as it wants gives. Companies like the GEs and, uh, and, and others who are, are, we're finding out are paying effective tax rates of somewhere between 0 and 2% every year, it turns out, gives them a huge advantage over domestic firms. And I, I think that kind of imbalance is wrong. So I would end deferral. And uh, in the same spirit, I'd try to move towards ending these preferences in the tax code. I'd rather tax capital, dividends, income, I'd rather tax them all, if not the same, close to the same, because when you don't do that, you're basically begging for all kinds of uh, gaming and, and, and income shifting. Nancy? I like what they said. You, you like, what he said. <laughs> That's what the he way said. I order, too. I'm the last person exactly. to order, and I say, I'll have what yeah. she's having, <laughs> or, you know, or whatever. Ch chocolate. Yeah. Okay, we've got a wireless microphone. And we're going to pass it around, but I just, I just, all I ask is that you say your name and your affiliation first, and then your question. Go ahead. Uh, Ken Broad, Delaware Investments. The one thing you that's not mentioned and not up there is charitable deductions, and mm. it feels like we are steaming towards a kind of cap on everything. That feels categorically very different. It's a voluntary contribution, mm -hmm. and so the nonprofits I'm involved with are very concerned that they get thrown under the bus, yeah. which is behavior we want to try to incent. Right? Is America has a long history of being very charitable, so. So I, maybe I'll, I, it's a tough one, and I'm, I, I actually um, I have a paper about when President Obama first proposed his deduction limit, saying what the effect on charitable uh, giving would be, and you know it's pretty big. So I, I'm torn because on the one hand I agree with you we want to incent it. On the other hand, uh, my sense is that a fair amount of charitable giving is more like personal consumption, um, and to me it's, that's a tough one. Is I don't want to tell people what to give their charities to, but I don't want the government to support their going to the Kennedy Center and seeing the show. Um, and it's tough to distinguish those. I know the tax code tries to, but to me that's the, that's the challenge with the you, issue. You know, when you do ask people, there have been surveys done where you ask people, would you, if it were, if you didn't get that deduction, would you stop giving to your local volunteer firefighter? A lot of people say, no, I'd still give. I, I don't know. Well, I mean, you, sir, you see, I think live and effect. breathe this and depend on yeah. this, and it is certainly an incentive for people. There'd be an effect. There'd be an effect. I'll probably draw some boos on this, but I, I don't think that that's the real conversation about the tax-exempt community. The real conversation has to be about what is tax-exempt and what is not tax-exempt, because we have a very difficult time distinguishing between the two. Uh, it, let's, let's talk about hospitals. If you move to a situation where almost everybody is in the healthcare system, how do you differentiate any longer between a not-for-profit or a profit making hospital? Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the toughest roles I had when I was at the service was, was we spent a lot of time talking about tax exempt entities. They're the subject of all kinds of structuring where the, the profit making business wants to tie up with the, with the tax exempt entity so that they can 
transfer the costs, mm -hmm. and, and uh, there's no impact on the tax exempt entity. Uh, as as the an executive at a leading tax exempt in Indiana said to me, that's just a tax status. That's not a way of doing business, and and it's an issue. It has been missed in this conversation. Neither Ways and Means nor Finance mm -hmm. is looking at it. But sooner or later, because of states and really municipalities, mm -hmm. it's a bigger issue when you get down to the cities as to wh what who's is, paying taxes yeah. or not. Right. Sooner or later, we're going to get to that. So I think that's, that's an even the, deeper issue than, issue than the yeah. contribution. Yeah. Really. Let, let me tell you, our city of Baltimore and it has a number of problems. But one of them is the institutions and, and, and government agencies, of which we are very proud. But you put together the Hopkins, the universities, the other private institutions, and you've got a tremendous proportion of, of, uh, of the tax base that's tax exempt. Right. right. Yeah. That, that's a great, that's an excellent point. My only point, just a quick uh, point to that, is that, you know, if you did cap at 28%, uh, for example, there would still be an incentive to contribute. It would be diminished. So okay. I, I'm not there, disagreeing with you. There's a question up here. I have a question, oh, too. Oh, there. Oh, I didn't realize. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm just, we're, I was curious if you could just elaborate on the corporate tax. You, it's been completely absent from this conversation. And mm -hmm. is it not an area where we can raise a lot of money? And I'd be interested to hear people's thoughts on the consequences of repatriation or um, you know, or not in the concept of recycling capital. Well, Jared just said he thought it was a bad idea, which I thought was interesting, right? Yeah, well, I think it has a, a really lousy track record. And by the way, the deferral idea I mentioned, that's corporate. That's part of corporate tax reform. Right, and let, let's explain why it has a bad track record. All you have to do is look back at Pfizer. Pfizer got to repatriate, uh, what, what year was it? When, well, 2004. Okay, 2004. Yeah. So there was that, that sort of... We the jobs, it was called the Jobs Act, wasn't it? Yeah, it was called the Jobs Act. Well, they call everything a Jobs and, Act. And yeah. ironically, yeah. amazingly yeah. as it's called the Jobs Act, <laughs> Pfizer brought back a lot of money and they laid off a stunning, what was it, 13,000? I don't remember the numbers, but that was, was one of the problems. It was a stunning number of U.S. Layoffs, employees. share buybacks, Okay, but right. could we do it if, payouts? Jared, could we do it if we had a, a sort of a caveat in there? You can't. Well, I can't, guess you can't so, tell corporate. So interestingly, in the recent, so you, you, are, uh, we're, we're saying that when we did this before, in, they, they repatriated a bunch of money, which you would do because instead of paying the, the statutory rate, they got to pay 5%. So yes, there's a huge incentive. But instead of leading to higher investment or jobs, it led to share buybacks, dividend payouts, and there happened to be a bunch of layoffs. So it had exactly the opposite of what a Jobs mm -hmm. Act effect would have. So recently there was some discussion, well, if we have a repatriation, let's take Liz's idea and um, make rules. Some percent of what you repatriate has to be used for investment. Some percent has to be used for job creation. And the mm -hmm. lobbyists in favor of repatriation said, uh-uh, no thanks. That's you not can't, the way and we that, you can't you enforce can't it anyway. But yeah. This goes back to an earlier point I was trying to make about consistent treatment of economic activities. The debate, one of the positive uh, features of the debate is it's changed. Two years ago, all the, the, the noise was about corporate rates and this repatriation issue. And, and I really give Dave Camp tremendous credit on this because he's, he has consistently said, no, we got to look at the whole continuum across individuals and businesses. Mm -hmm. And then we also have to look at form, uh, you know, C-corps yeah. and flow-throughs. That's where we got to deal with this. And okay. I mean, how much money would you raise if you were to get rid of the deferral that you talk about? Um, you know, many, numerous hundreds of billions over 10 years, but I can't remember the right. It's actually in the president's budget, so I, I could get you the right number. Okay. So Let's wait, get can I, can I, I just had one quick thought, which was I, I think corporate reform is really important. And in some sense, the, the tax code now is pro debt and anti equity, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And interest is deductible, and equity is, the return on equity is double taxed. And that's the direction to, to, to move away from. But I think it's just hard to do it on its own because of the pass-throughs. You know, if you help the corporates but not the pass-throughs, it's, it's too hard. So I think ultimately it has to be part of a bigger, okay, this bigger reform. Jared, state tax deduction. Should Texas, Alaska, Florida, Washington, should they be subsidizing New York and California? And second question for Mark, and I'll carry forwards. Should we be taxing carry forwards? Um, well, since Nancy's here, uh, uh, <laughs> I, I tread carefully. No, I thought Nancy <laughs> made great points uh, in terms of state and local. If that were on my, uh, on, on my evaluator list, um, especially uh, with her comments, you know, I would, I would have to score that a, a, as scoring pretty high on um, efficiency and fairness. Uh, revenues foregone is kind of in the middle range, I think, or maybe kind of high. Um, I think it would be a very tough political lift. Look, I think it's a pretty 
um, good way of supporting um, the kinds of investments that, that Nancy uh, liked. And, it, and your question reminds us that while we make, can you put up slide three very quickly? While we make all these claims about how, you know, we should, we should get rid of $1.1 trillion of tax expenditures, which are bigger than all those other things you see there. Um, in fact, there's a lot of things that are in that tax expenditure bar that we would want to keep. And state and local, um, uh, probably the state and local exemption, especially in terms of the munis, uh, makes sense to me. So does the earned income credit. The child, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in there. That's all. Mm -hmm. Mark, do you want to address I the question? I think that's here? a legitimate question. I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other, frankly. Okay. There was a question here, this young lady. Thank you. All right. I had a question. Oh, and then... The would you support purposes. a balanced budget amendment as a part of tax reform so that we would generate the revenue that we spend? Philip? Um, I, 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 we need to move to, toward a balanced budget. Would I change the Constitution to have an amendment? I prefer Congress just to do his job and for the President to, to do that, right? his or her job. <laughs> so I, I, so my, my answer is, is no, because I think they're better, they're better and more appropriate uh, ways for us to do that. I'd rather have some of this voters and taxpayers be responsible for, for uh, making that decision. So that's my, anyway, that's my answer. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Manju Ganeriwala. I'm state treasurer for Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, my question is for <laughs> Phil. Sir, no, no, for Nancy. But, um, Do you want to come up here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're on the hook too, Jared, since election. you're supporting no, the cap. Yeah. So, um, my question is, uh, we talked about simplification in tax reform. And I'll, my question relates to a subject matter that I know a little about, which is municipal bond financing. Mm -hmm. um, by, uh, by putting a cap, right now an investor who invests in muni bonds gets the entire interest as tax-exempt interest. Mm -hmm. So the l highest tax bracket is 39%. They get 39% benefit, to, mm -hmm. so to say. Mm -hmm. When you cap it to 28%, that 11% is lost. Right. When Nancy and I go to marketplace to issue bonds under a cap, then the marketplace is going to demand extra price for losing that 11% mm -hmm. benefit. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but what I'm trying to point out that there is inefficiency in what you're proposing in CAP. When the marketplace looks at it, they're going to add a risk premium. So it's not a zero-sum game that the feds, you know, cap it at 28% mm -hmm. and then right. the states right. have to pick up the 11%. We get the, it. Yeah. The yeah. risk yeah. premium is there. And um, they're and they're going to be concerned that today the Congress capped it at 28 percent. Two years from now they would cap it at 20 percent. Mm -hmm. okay. So, okay. The, so, so, so what's the point of tax reform if it adds Phil, complexity Phil, and Phil is going to answer that. For yeah, you. it's a great. No, no, no it's a it's absolutely a question. And, and just <laughs> to make sense, to, to to remember, I said when I support a cap, that is an intermediate step. It's a first step toward the end. And I think in the end, as a nation, we should decide: do we want to support charitable giving through the tax code? Boom, that's it. Um, you know, what activities, oil pipelines, MLPs, you know, whatever it is that we decide as a nation to support, let's support those mm -hmm. things. Employer-provided health care, and let's, let's do it. For me, the cap has lots of distortions. It's a way to, um, to move the debate forward. And in the end, right, if we as a nation decide to subsidize blue states, you know, spending, I, I live in one, um, then, you know, if South Dakota has to subsidize you know, sort of California and New York, well, that, that can be a, na a national decision, but, but let's have, let's, right, right, right. you know, have the honest decision. And, and I agree that all the effects you said are, are exactly, uh, are absolutely in there. Yeah, I mean, muni bonds are, are a very touchy situation. It's Where's the mic? Oh, right there. Okay, and then we're going to give it to this gentleman far over there. Hi, I'm Anna Solomon. I'm an estate tax attorney for the IRS, but I'm obligated to say I'm here for under my personal capacity. <laughs> um, but are, you, are you on furlough today? <laughs> I, I, I'm taking vacation for this. So um, oh, my question boy. is, what do you think of the future of the estate and gift tax, and what do you think should be mm. done with the estate and gift tax? Yeah, we didn't get to the estate tax. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I was thinking when, when Jared, you were, was it sure. you, Jared, who was bringing up... Um, the estate yeah. tax and 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 it's only a tiny percentage, yeah. same as carried interest. I mean, just look from. Uh, I, I think the estate tax would score it's a small number of estates. Would score. Would I, I I think it would score very. The the recent regressive changes to the estate tax would score uh, very low on uh, any kind of evaluator. Um, the uh, um, exemptions. You know, basically in the in the in the tax changes that occurred at the end of 2012, the uh, 
ATRA, uh, you know, the fiscal cliff deal, um, the estate tax was going to come back down to the pre-Bush tax cut level, which was, you know, perhaps too uh, progressive. I think the cap, um, the, the uh, deduction would have started at like one and a half million or something. I'm sure you know the rules better than me. The rate would have gone up to 55. Um, they they um, made a compromise that uh, I thought was uh, too uh, regressive. They raised the cap to, uh, uh, was it three and a half million per person or seven million per a couple? It was five, so five. 10, so five yeah. and 10. Yeah. That's, you know, talk about a fractional percent of estates. You know, I remember uh, uh, the New York Times did a piece on um, how all the people who were advocating for such a regressive change said it's gonna whack family farms. So the Times, to their credit, said, to these advocates, find me one family farm that will be affected by this. They could not find one. So this is just, uh, I think, a great example of um, how we're losing revenue based on uh, politicians that are protecting a tiny, narrow slice mm -hmm. of the elite. Because, again, I hear this rounding error, let's not bother. Again, when you aggregate a lot of rounding errors, you do start to get meaningful revenue. And there's more than rounding error. error involved to so the again the, the person that I'm talking about you say you exempt 10 million dollars I mean this is I, I, it, it's not it's not real it has nothing to do with reality. Sir question? Hector Negroni fundamental advisors um, one thing one thing that frustrates me in the discussion around the municipal marketplace enormously is that we don't focus on the issue of efficiency the frank nature of the market is that the municipal marketplace is really inefficiently structured because it depends on only tax exempt buyers for the predominant available capital. Additionally, the Joint Committee on Taxation, by its own admission last summer, scores the exemption meaningfully wrong. It's closer to $100 billion okay, of loss. We're, we're running out of so, time, so, what's so the, the question? question is, why wouldn't you pursue a different form of subsidy rather than the exemption, which can increase efficiency? That type of framework will really make a change Phil? in changing the deficit. And, and I think it's a great, it's exactly the right question. And to the administration's credit, I think they did push forward on this with their buy, the Build America, Buy America bonds. Yeah. The, oh, okay. Um, I, so, so I give the administration credit. I, I wish they would do that in the context of a bigger reform and say, look, we're going to unfragment this market and make it more efficient. And here's how, and here's, here's the other pieces of our puzzle. I think that's what's that's what missing. Okay. I, I agree with you. So, so they're I icing do. us out of here, as you can feel. Um, <laughs> but as, as we finish, feel free to mob the panelists later, but just don't clog the could doorway. I just, could I just put mm. in one, one little thing for the Constitution and federalism? Mm -hmm. It has served us well. Yes. I, it has served us well. Mm -hmm. And I think to undermine it and make it impossible by taking away from the states the ability to manage their own fiscal affairs would be a terrible mistake. Okay, so let me just finish by saying this, and it's a, a little personal note here, that my parents are Canadian, Canadian born. Saskatchewan, nothing chic. Um, <laughs> but I know, I was like, don't we have any cloud anywhere? What would be anywhere? chic? Uh, <laughs> Montreal is kind of chic. Beautiful, um, beautiful country. My dad left Canada as a, as a surgeon making his way because he felt he could get a much better life for his kids here in the United States. And he became very self-made man, successful, world-renowned surgeon, mm. Lakers doctor, Ronald Reagan's on-call urologist. He almost, almost operated on the Shah of Iran, but then the Shah fell. Nuts. Um, <laughs> but my point is this, that my dad always said that this is the greatest nation, and it allowed me to do so much better than I would have elsewhere. And my feeling about taxes is this, that we owe what we make, not all of it, but to a great degree, to pay for what has become a very great nation. Do we like the way our taxes are spent? Not 100%, not even sometimes 20%, but the fact is that we gotta remember how lucky we are to be here in the United States of America. And I would like to thank the Milken Group and the Milken Institute for all of this and our great, great panel. Yes, Mark? I've gotta say, you know, they're looking for an IRS commissioner and you'd do a great <laughs> job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you. I didn't get attacked at the end, it's awesome. Thank you so much and we hope you enjoyed it. Yeah.